A lot of teachers still believe in learning styles, like that you're a visual learner or an auditory learner, and that each student has one of those that works best for them. But um, the neuroscience now is finding out that that actually has been a myth. And people love that idea, so they're having a hard time letting go of it. But it turns out they're finding that all human brains actually process information best when they're receiving a blend of visual and auditory or linguistic input into their brain together. So this is called dual coding theory, and it better represents how your students' brains are gonna best learn their math lessons, uh, no matter what their preferred style might be, that's the way that they're gonna actually retain it and understand it in the most clear way. And so the dual coding theory better represents that. Um, and the way that it works is your brain stores graphic visual information in a totally separate zone, physically separate area of the brain than word information, like heard words that you're saying to them and they're hearing and written words that they're seeing as text, any kind of linguistic input. And so those two areas in the brain have to connect in order to convert that information into long-term memory. And so the best way to teach your students is to blend visual information and linguistic information together. Um, and so that's where uh, the doodle note theory was developed and this method. So they also have the creative input, which um, causes the two hemispheres of the brain to cross over and interact together, which also has been proven to boost learning. And so it's a method that teachers, you know, hundreds of thousands of teachers now, millions of students have found success with uh, my doodle note method. And so the biggest question I get though is how to actually make it possible and how to teach with this method. And it can be confusing. So that's what we're gonna be um, talking about today. So doodle notes, you can do these yourself and I'm gonna teach you some DIY strategies and how to implement, you know, templates in all different ways, whatever you need for your own students. But they're really like a cross between sketch notes, which are kind of free form, and infographics, which blend visuals and text. But with a little more guidance and scaffolding, more interaction for your students, and some built-in features that boost, you know, memory, focus, and, and even relaxation. They even help with math anxiety. Um, so how can you become one of these teachers who's seeing great success with this without, you know, taking a ton of time because... We don't have it right now. We just don't have extra time, extra energy, anything. So we're going to talk about some specific specific strategies of how to actually get those brain benefits, activate those neural pathways in your own students' brains by, you know, quickly and easily implementing the doodle note method in your own classroom um, without having to jump through too many hurdles. So I'll give you lots of options. So as far as an introduction, I'm Bridget and I'm from mathgiraffe.com, but you may be familiar with the blog of, you know, teaching math in different creative ways, um, which kind of sprouted off into doodle notes, of course, which caught on and became the doodle note method. And so I have that trademark method at doodlenotes.org. You can learn more about that, um, get some free resources to help you get started right away. I've got a ton of free content to help you get going on, on doodle notes. And then there's also the Doodle Note Club I've got. Um, that's me as well, teaching teachers how to make their own and use this method. Um, and then my most recent project is the Snow Day Magazine. That's my new creative lifestyle magazine for teachers as well. So that's who, um, who I am and where I'm from. And I know a lot of you were in the, um, the summer conference as well. And we talked about just in general math plus creativity. And so now we're going to get a little more into the nitty gritty of specifically visual note taking. We're starting with implementation and actually teaching with visual notes, visual guided notes. So as far as best practices, uh, tip number one, you want to use a teacher model, especially at first until your students get the hang of this. And so that can be, uh, you know, with an Elmo document camera, something like that. It can be on one of those big interactive screens. It can just be, you know, projected onto the whiteboard and you use markers. Um, whatever you have that will work. A screen share if that's, you know, the best you've got for distance learning. But um, even an overhead projector, if that's, what, if that's the tech level you're at, I, I'm right there with you. So you want to be modeling to your students um, how they're going to interact with this page while you lecture. So the best way to use Doodle Notes, especially at first when your students are not as familiar with it, is you're going to teach your lesson the way you normally would in a lecture. 
And instead of doing your examples on the board, just like this, where the student notes just go through, you know, every page of their notebook looks the same, you're just going to start with the visual template or the doodle note lesson or whatever you've got that you're using as graphic notes. And you're going to do the teacher model while you talk them through. And your teacher model might just be bare bones, like you might be doing like guided notes, you know, but since you're teaching and you're going over side examples and talking more and more and more than what's on the page, the students will have little tiny seconds in between of downtime. And so they are going to spend their time in between whatever you're chatting about or pausing or answering and asking questions. They're going to use that extra time that's kind of just sprinkled throughout the lecture to add extra creative input that's relevant to the lesson on their page. So your model might be very basic, but you're also going to show another thing, which is a sample. And so you're going to show a colored completed student sample of a doodle note page and they'll, they'll get the hang of this real quick because a lot of them love interacting with it. Um, and then they will see that they are going to be able to, you know, take some more time than what you're doing and color in those vocabulary words and, you know, doodle a relevant little image on the side, some icons that help them remember that keyword and things like that. So I'm going to talk more in detail in a minute about what they should be drawing and doing, and you can focus more in on the nitty gritty of that. But basically you're lecturing, they're hearing your voice. They're seeing you give just a very simple model of what they're supposed to be doing on their page, but then they have time to add a lot more creative input and embellish their page. Um, another question that I get often, um, implementation tip number two here is how much time. And so people are like, oh my gosh, my kids are wasting all this time coloring and all that. And you do not want that. We don't want wasted time. I am like very anti-fluff. So I believe in never wasting any time in that math classroom, no matter what, you have too much to get through. So your lecture should take the same amount of time as it always has, exactly the same. Um, they can always color more for homework if they really want or in free time or study hall. Some kids get really into it and they want to. And those that don't, that's totally fine. Like they do not need to have every single thing colored in. That is not really adding as much extra brain benefit after the lecture. Um, it's really what they're doing and interacting with it while they're hearing your voice and seeing the words and the graphics all at the same time. So you don't need to give any extra time for coloring. They will sneak it in. You don't realize how much downtime they're having during a normal lecture. So where they used to be on their line notebook page, just copying as examples like this, they would pause every now and then. And you, you know, some of them were probably doodling in the margins anyways. And so the graphic layout and interacting with that while you're talking is going to actually ignite their brain pathways better because each page looks different. The layout represents how the concepts interact with each other and the relationship between ideas, or you're using a different template each time with different number of subcategories and different ways that the page layout, um, you know, interacts with the material really. And so what they're doing while they're listening, it creates this like mental connection. So they'll remember like, oh yeah, I remember the teacher saying that. It wasn't something I wrote in the notes, but I remember her saying that when I was drawing little spirals around this word. Um, and then they remember what the word was because they remember, oh, I was doing that really tall coloring for the letter L like this. And, and they're gonna put all those little connections together whether they realize it or not. And then when they get to their test, they will be able to visualize that page and in their brain, like almost hear what you were saying when they did that different interaction on the page with their colored pencil. Because the brain makes connections, the hand to the mind, and, and it helps that stuff stick surprisingly very well. Um, and the students will start to notice that. And so you might have some resistant kids at the beginning. Uh, that's another question I get a lot. So if some of them aren't that into it, like that's fine. They don't have to color rainbows all over their page. They don't have to, you know, spend hours on it after school. They just have to get the basics. And so much of those brain benefits that are embedded in there into the strategy are, they're gonna happen automatically. They don't really need to force it or get super creative, the more they do, you know, the more they'll be invested in the page and come back to review it later, which is great. 
But as they start to realize, you know, on once you've done this for more than one chapter, they'll be like, oh my gosh, that did really help me remember it better. And they'll they'll get a little a little more into it. And if they don't, that's fine. Not everybody's enthused about, you know, colored pencils. Eh, and that's okay. <laughs> so no big deal there. Um so another tip or strategy for actually implementing this is encourage your kids to pick just five colors. And um, I've got here an example of how you want to pick those five colors. And so you can really, if you're short on supplies, you can take a big pack of color pencils, break it down and distribute it for the whole class if you kind of plan the color schemes carefully. So they just need like one really dark color um, for long chunks of text that they're writing or little sketches and doodles that really need to be, you know, show up clearly. And then like a light highlighting color, which they might not want to use for long blocks of text because it doesn't show up well, but they'll use it to, you know, point out, highlight in the arrows or color over a word that they still need to see behind like a highlighter. Um, and then just a couple more that have some contrast so that their colors will stand out because you want to have some variety for when you are color coding. Sometimes you need two or three colors for different color coding types of things. Um, anytime you can have them color code different segments, that is going to help a lot. Color coding sticks really well in, in their brains. Um, it can be positives, negatives, it can be all different things, but whatever in that lesson, you can have them color code as they go. Try to do that anytime you can. Um, okay, and then uh, another tip is that once they're finished with it, just encourage them to reference it and have it in a binder and come back to it and study from it because they have this visual guide now. It's almost like a, you know, amped up version of a graphic organizer that they can study from, they can, you know, add to and embellish as they study, highlight things, draw some arrows and connections as they go, um, and, and a little more, more sketches and everything. Okay, and more implementation tips here. We wanna focus on um, as far as the content and how you're teaching this and how you're giving little reminders as they work through the strategy. You want them to focus on visual memory triggers. These are one of the magical components that make Doodle Notes work for students. A visual memory trigger, um, that's like the name I made up to kind of represent these, these dual coding theory graphics. And so remember that dual coding theory is about blending a word or a piece of text or you know something they're hearing, an actual word or phrase with something visual, some graphic input that sticks a picture in their mind. There's that picture superiority effect that you're going to remember an image better than just a word. And it's like the first red flag that your brain kind of rings up or sees just like on a stop sign you see the shape you see the color and the word is almost just like a background you already know it you're you, like it connects in your mind with that picture you don't actually need to even read it so you want to really focus them in on developing their own visual memory triggers or interacting with the ones on the page color a word into a shape that tells what it means or they can develop a little icon or logo that has the word integrated into an image that will help them remember the two being interconnected. And that will help them keep their vocabulary straight, you know, if it's different types of graph equations, different, any kind of different, um, for differentiating different key vocabulary words or uh, classifications of things, anything like that. So when you're dealing with any vocabulary, the visual memory triggers are just magical. So um, one person shared in the um, Facebook group, if you're, if you're not in there, come join us in the uh, Doodle Note Teacher Network Facebook group. Uh, it's really free and you can chat and ask questions, but one teacher shared, this was awesome. She had her kids make, a, make an icon library because these like icons, almost thinking like a logo that helps them to blend the text and graphic information together in a way that just like sticks if they cannot erase that connection from their mind. And it's it's just awesome. So they were able to develop a bunch of those and kind of get the hang of it. And um, practicing that on the side is wonderful, but you can even just do it as you go through, you know, different doodle note lessons and they, and they practice this. Um, so always that blend of graphic and linguistic information. Another thing you want to focus on is having a variety of interactive tasks. So a lot of times these are embedded if you get like, you know, a pre-made doodle note, but you don't have to do that. If you don't have the budget, you don't have any of that. You just can, you know, use a template and keep it, keep it simple. I'm going to show you ways to create your own really easily at home or with, you know, little shapes or whatever. 
Um, but if you're doing that from scratch, you might have to include these yourself, but you want interactive tasks included in there so that they're doing something interactive other than just writing notes. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, flippy foldy. I know the interactive notebooks, a lot of you are used to where they're doing all kinds of things. It doesn't even have to be that complicated. You don't need a glue stick or anything like that. You can just have it be, you know, classify or color code or label the parts, things like that. Um, nothing has to really move except their hand on, on the color pencil. And so a variety of interactive tasks, there's all different kinds of examples of what interactive tasks can, can be. Um, and then in addition to those visual memory triggers and interactive tasks, you want your layout to just be memorable and fit with the content. So something that shows the relationship between ideas is really going to make it stick because they are going to be able to see in their mind that page layout. They're going to visualize it because they interacted with it. So your layout combined with those interactive tasks where they're somehow, you know, classifying color coding, identifying things right within there. Um, they'll remember where in the layout that was and what they did, and, and it'll really help that information stick. Time for quick tips. Um, some of these are actually from some of the thousands of teachers who are using Doodle Notes. Um, I love when people share their tips so it's not all only coming from me, and we get some you know variety of feedback from all different classrooms. So one of them is uh, shrink it down. Print your pages at 80% so they can put it right inside their interactive notebook. This is great for people who do interactive notebooks with other flipping folding things because then they can have it all collected in one place. Another one was to actually increase the size and blow it up like a big poster and they can work as a group once, once students are allowed to be near each other again. That will be a good one for now. A poster may not work for you, but just kind of keep that tip logged in your memory. Um, I have a lot of these kind of collected in that doodle note handbook too, which, which is free if you haven't downloaded it yet. Um, another one, I love what this teacher said, to color code the borders. So she has students do an out, you know, just outline around the border of the page, you know, dark blue for everything in chapter one or unit one or whatever, and then orange for unit two so that they can really stay organized when they're studying and have everything in, in order for finals and all that kind of thing. Um, so color coding the borders. Another one, give a notebook grade. It doesn't have to be on prettiness or anything like that. They really, these don't have to be beautiful. Some kids take really great pride in making them beautiful and they're going to, you know, show them off to the world and think that their notes are the most beautiful thing. And they are, they do incredible work. Um, but you can just do it based on whether they've actually just done the bare bones criteria that you have. Have they, you know, colored just the vocabulary words that might be all that you care for it to be colored and done the color coding, the filling in the blanks, the interactive tasks and the labeling, then they're good to go. Um, but the best way I found to grade notebooks is to walk around during a test because they're not using them. You don't have to keep them. I first made the mistake of, you know, having crates of notebooks and decide if I want to like you know, okay, so I took all of this class period's notebooks for the night. Now they don't have it for their homework. Now do I take it home or do I sit here until 9 p.m. grading it, you know? And so, and have to do it for every period. And so I finally got smart and I just knew that they were never using them during a test. So they had to have it under, totally closed under their chair. And I would be walking around while I monitor the test is, you know, I could just pick it up and be still watching everybody while I'm flipping through, you know, and just make sure it's all there. Like that's all there is to it. If it's all there, they get their notebook grade. If they're missing a lesson or, you know, never caught up for makeup work or whatever, then they don't get the full points. So um, that, that was a really easy way where it seemed to be the best time and it didn't take any extra time out of my day that I had a stack of notebooks to actually sit down and grade to get back to them. Um, and okay. This one's a little bit of a tip from, from teachers, kind of, but it's just really that everybody um, reports that they use it in different ways. And so some people use Doodle Notes as the intro to their lesson, like for the first lecture when they're introducing a new topic. Um, another group of people said they use it after they've kind of touched on it and the kids are kind of solidifying the information, ready to switch into practice mode, and it kind of brings it all together. Um, once they've kind of seen and been exposed to it once. And then other people say they actually don't do any of that. 
they save it and use it as like a review at the end. So when they're bringing together a lesson and the kids already kind of have the idea, they fill this out as like a review study guide to create their doodle note at that point once they're kind of comfortable with the content. And so that shows you that you could just like do whatever works for you. Um, try it different ways, see what works for your own students. And you may, you know, shift this back and forth from year to year or even lesson to lesson. When you're dealing with something tricky, you might want to put it off a little bit. But when it's something that they can get through in the first, you know, use it to introduce. Um, so you really, that's your choice, but there's a lot of versatility and there's really no right or wrong way to um, make that kind of a decision. Um, it's really up to you. Um, my personal preference is to use it at the beginning for a lecture and then um, have them kind of build their own a little more free form as the review. And so I kind of developed some little bite-sized cards where they pull together and kind of choose their own layout once they're familiar with the content, choose the relationships, do some of that real critical thinking and, you know, metacognition about what would best represent this piece of a lesson and they kind of break it down into bite-sized a deck of review cards or you know make their own little sketch note template kind of thing once they're more comfortable. So I like to start with the super guided ones and then lead them into um, once they're familiar like kind of more freeform create their own and really get comfortable with the content while they build their study guide with much less guidance. Okay, just a couple more implementation tips. Um, number one, to totally get started from scratch out of the gate, I have already done this for you and made a page that will introduce the concept to your kids. So it's totally free. So you're gonna go download the, it's called Engage Your Brain Doodle Notes. And it's basically a doodle note lesson about doodle notes that is like the first one you're gonna start with. And it teaches your kids the strategy why it works, how it works, but in the meantime also models, let's try it while we learn. So they're learning about this method by doing it throughout the page. Um, and I even now, this is an, a new addition, so this might be a surprise to some of you who have used this page before, um, or it's two pages, this, this lesson. Um, I now have my voice guiding them through it. So if you would like that, where I'm talking to them about how their brain is working and kind of introducing the idea, um, I, the whole lesson is now like done for you. So I will give you the link, I, but it's it's at masteraff.com. I um, have a page where you can listen to those two audio clips for each page of this lesson, and you can just play that for your kids. They can listen to me like a podcast, talking them through it. So I'm providing the lecture, the audio input into their brain while they're interacting with the visual input on the page and the text, the other linguistic of the words, and they're gonna do it while I talk them through it. So that is a fun lesson where you could be modeling it if you want, or you can just let them, you know, show the sample to them and listen and, listen and go um, totally hands off for you. Um, and also nice for distance learning because your students can then be off screen, listen to my voice in their ears, headphones or whatever, and do the page, um, right along with, with me teaching them how this works. Um, a couple more tips are go ahead when you get the hang of this and teach your kids more and more sketch note skills because they can build the sketch notes themselves once they get the hang of it. But at first, that's just a huge hurdle for them to, to have a blank page and start from scratch with how the information all connects before they even know how, how the information connects because they don't, haven't learned it yet. And so, but you can start having them practice baby steps toward sketch note skills. So um, there, that's like with the icon library idea, you can have them practice making icons. You can have them use the visual vocabulary prompts to practice developing their own little logo, their own little ad, magazine cover, something that blends the word with its meaning pictorially um, in, a, in a picture graphic. Um, they can also, there's this example of five ways to practice sketch note skills where they can kind of use that or post a poster in your classroom. Um, this one happens to be free that they can kind of reference how to get started with making their own for when they want to start using this strategy to pull together information and review or you assign them, you know, make a group sketch note or make yourself a review page. Um, they can kind of practice using different containers and shapes, arrows to show the connections and all that kind of thing. 
And the more independent they can get and get off of some of the guided versions, that's even better for their brain. But it, uh, using a mix of all these strategies is usually best because if you can replace all your note taking and all your review with some kind of visual, um, visual notes where you've provided it at the beginning with guidance and then led them to create their own to really show that they understand it at the end, then you've got all those brain benefits working together throughout their building of knowledge, scaffolded as they go. Okay, a great resource that you'll wanna take advantage of are Doodle Note templates. I have some of these available for free for you to try out. So they just have kind of the backdrop, the layout, and then you can customize these to any lesson content. So if there's you know a specific topic you're gonna to tackle, you can choose which layout might work best for it based on how many subtopics or you know the relationship between the pieces of the ideas of the lesson. Um, and then you can add you know a graphing template if it's something for graphing. You can stick some images over top and just then make it go. So if you're going to be using templates, there's a few ways that you can customize them so that you can use a doodle note type of strategy for any lesson content. Um, one first thing you can do is if you like to work with it on the computer and you're, you're pretty good with, you know, adding text boxes over top, you can just stick one of these images, a template image right in the background um, of, you know, Google Slides or PowerPoint. PowerPoint tends to be the best because it lets the images and the text boxes kind of overlap and work together a lot more smoothly than anything else. Um, so I'd recommend that, but you can just stick the slide in the background and then add text boxes right over top. Um, you can make your words bubble letters in PowerPoint by um, making the fill of the text white and then the outline of the text black. And that'll turn any font into like a bubble letter style font that the kids can color in the vocabulary word. So you can just put some big basic text for like your lesson title and then the big key concepts or vocabulary words they're going to be breaking down. Um, don't do that for all your text. You know, if you have body text, just leave that or directions, you know, a normal, small, readable font for them. Uh, don't, don't go too crazy here. <laughs> you can also insert images in that way. So if you want to add a piece of clip art or even just hand draw an, a, a visual memory trigger that they can work with, you can do that as well. Um, you can do even the text by hand too. A lot of you I know it's quicker for you to just do it on a page and then photocopy it compared to getting into the computer software and messing with text boxes. So if you prefer that over all the formatting digitally, you can just do it by hand and add just a couple little teacher notes on the template or any input you want and just go ahead and photocopy it with your, you know, little doodle and two big vocabulary words that you want to provide for them as a little bit of structure um, or something like that. So you can do a little teacher prep with templates if you want, or you can also do templates without really doing any prep ahead of time if you don't even have time to prepare it. So if you don't have time to prepare it on the back end, that's fine. Just take the doodle note template and print it as it is and just distribute it. Um, I've got a few resources that are designed for that that are able to be just customized to anything. So if you, you know, the card deck, for example, has just mini bite-sized, uh, doodle friendly graphic organizers and then they the kids will do the rest so they can just choose the layout that works best or you can you can choose for them whatever you think and these would be you know easy DIY too. just draw a couple shapes give them just a basic structure um, you can do on your, your own drawing on a half page just DIY this and just print it as it is and give it to them you know, just and let them go, guide them through it without preparing anything ahead of time and just say, okay, in this top box, we're going to start with this. And then here's how it connects with this other idea. Um, and another set that's designed to be customized to any, um, any kind of lesson content is like the visual vocabulary prompts. So you can just distribute something simple like that and use it for any different set of lesson content or vocabulary words. Um, another great way is if you do have a little bit of budget to buy sticker paper. You can print um, clip art shapes or anything like that on sticker paper that they can then stick and build their own page within their notebook. So um, there's, I got a big pack of, I think a hundred pages of sticker paper. Oh, I can't, I'm, I'm, I can't remember the price for sure, but it wasn't too bad as far as like just prepping a set of shapes that they could then use for multiple lessons and give each kid just a couple sheets um, that they can pull from. And they really only need, you know, a couple shapes per page to kind of build a bit of a structure. 
I also have templates for this if you do want it kind of already done for you. But then the students can just basically cut around the sticker, peel and go. So no glue sticks or anything like that. And they have the elements that help them build a visual note page right in their notebook. So you could choose for them like, okay, we're going to use this shape here that breaks down in two arrows because this is the way that our content is subdivided today as far as that lesson, or you can let them choose themselves if they're ready to go, you know, a little more off of your, off of your structure and your guidance. So you can choose whether you're going to pick the sticker shapes for them or let them build their own graphic layout. Um, but these are really nice because you don't, you don't have to prepare too much. I like to just kind of get a whole stack of them ready and then they can use them time after time and just cut it out and keep the rest in a little pocket. Um, that way you don't necessarily have to have your act together as much before every lesson topic, but they can kind of build one and go with it as, as you uh, wing it, you know, not, not that you would ever wing it as you go through a lecture of a lesson. Um, but also you could just print them blank templates so they can just get started and go. Um, you, you really don't have to have too much on the back end if, if it's not available or you don't have the time. You can just kind of print the template and have them fill it out with you as you teach them the lesson content. Keep it simple when you've got to, right? Okay, so I know a lot of you right now though are, you know, teaching your students from a distance. So we've covered kind of the general best practices and I want to talk about digital like to get, you know, second best practices, what we really can make possible when we're dealing with distance learning or kids don't have a printer, like what are our options for doing it on screen or getting them access to make this happen from their own homes. Um, so we have a few possibilities here. Uh, the big, the big takeaway message is, before you dive into any kind of on-screen note-taking overlays, there's some tools. I'm going to talk you through some tools, some strategies, some different ways you can make it possible. Um, but the big, the biggie that I want you to remember is anytime you can get their actual hand with a real coloring tool interacting on an actual piece of paper is the best. So if it's kind of like, oh, it would be a pain for them to print it, but they could, like, please try to encourage whenever they can to print it. Or if you have some in-school days, like your hybrid, and you have some days in school, some days off school, like, even if you're gonna have them do it at home, like, do print it for them and give it to them to do on their at-home day while you talk to them through the screen or whatever, because it really is worth prioritizing doing this on paper rather than trying to have them interact with the actual note taking on screen. They're going to get the most of the brain benefits if their hand to mind connection is actually through real color pencils and they're able to do more because once they start getting on the screen, it's a pain, there's hurdles and it's not gonna happen as smoothly and you'll, you'll be able to get some of the brain benefits but not all of them. So just keep that in mind. It's also really good for them, like mentally relaxes them to get creative and color. Um, it's, it's really good for their mental health, which a lot of our students really need right now. So the relaxation, you know, just like adult coloring books and all that, like if you can get them to actually get their eyes off the screen and take a break, it's going to be better no matter what. Um, they're in, just like input mode all the time right now when they're on home learning. They're reading something, you know, an article on the screen, or they're following a link to watch a video. There's stuff going into their brain, into their brain, into their brain, but they need to do some output. Like they have to put something forth out of themselves, something creative, especially. Creative hobbies are so good for us and creative output really helps like kind of regenerate them. And so if you can get them, even if they sit there with a blank piece of paper, they can find a blank piece of paper somewhere in their home or a notebook page and guide them to actually just put out some creativity onto the page of their own doing instead of dragging and dropping things on a screen or reading what's provided to them. If you can get them in output mode instead of input mode, that'll be great. But for when you can't, let's talk about the tools you can use when the kids are on a computer. 
One wonderful tool that is completely free is called Doc Hub. You'll need your Doodle Note pages or your Doodle Note template or whatever you want students working on to be in PDF format. But if they're not already, that's no problem. You can convert it with your smartphone just by taking a picture of the page, save it as a PDF and email it to yourself. And then once you upload that file into Doc Hub, it's just a free website. You can have students add it as a Chrome extension. It will become a background and your students can then interact on top of it in a new layer by doodling with their little colored pen tool that they have in Doc Hub, highlighting, filling in any labels, blanks. They can even insert text boxes or images if you want. So they can go ahead and hand write right on here, add notes, add drawings, color, all of that, um, which makes it really handy. And adding simple clip art or icons can sometimes be a good thoughtful interactive task for them if you do want to add that too. TPT now has a similar tool as well. So anytime you're downloading a free Doodle Note, a Doodle Note template, or a complete Doodle Note set from there, you may have this option as well. It has similar tools to what Doc Hub has. In this one, I really recommend using the highlight tool for any coloring, like you can make it a little thicker, medium or thick line. So it makes coloring go really quickly, especially for the words. And then the pen tool can be set to thin for writing notes and any sketching. It has different colors so they can do color coding. Um, the kids have to drop the pen tool and click the select arrow again to move around the page and zoom in and out, but they can quickly get the hang of that. Um, and it now has a new shape tool in there too, which is really nice. Another great option is we have these free Google slide templates for you, and this allows you to have your students do doodle notes at home without having them actually do it on a screen. And this is nice if they don't have a stylus or something because that can get kind of cumbersome on screen. So you just have them get out a blank piece of paper or a fresh page in their notebook. And then this free slide template we designed just to do exactly all the rest. So you'll be able to add your own link to a video of you teaching or to an audio recording or some online video, whatever you want to provide for the learning. And then these slides actually will guide your students through the process of making their own visual notes to go along with it. It's as easy as it could possibly be. So you can use this over and over. This free Google slide template is uh, linked in your toolkit inside the complete guide to hybrid and distance doodle notes. So you can find this and access it and just use it over and over and it guides your kids through the steps for kind of doing it on their own, even if they're at home and far away from you. Makes it really easy. Another great distance learning option is to record your voice talking students through the material. You can do this with your phone and no editing is necessary. Just make it quick and scrappy. This is much faster and easier than trying to make a video for your kids or do any editing or anything. And then just upload the audio files to your class website. Students can access it and listen to it like a podcast in their ears while they interact with their visual notes. This is wonderful for asynchronous learning and it's also great because they don't need their eyes on the screen like they would for a video. Their visual focus can be on their notes while they're still receiving that audio input from you. You can listen to a sample of how I do this and verbally walk kids through the Doodle Note lessons at masterf.com slash supplement to kind of check that out and see how I just, you know, if I fumble, I just keep going, like just go ahead and make an audio file just like you would if you were talking right to your students and upload it as is, it's a lot quicker. Okay, so now that we've covered some of the like online, you know, digital options that you've got, um, let's talk about you as a teacher doing the DIY. So save your money, get, you know, make this happen when you need to do. So you can take a blank piece of paper and quickly and easily build a doodle note template that your students can then use and you can save to use year after year. So a couple options. Number one option is get your hands on a few stencils. You probably have, you know, some shape shape stencils or basic things um, lying around. Um, and you can then kind of trace the shapes and put it in a layout that best fits what you're actually teaching in that lesson. Um, you know, put a square for the coordinate plane and then, you know, some arrows and concept boxes around and you can teach a lesson in that way and then photocopy your, you know, stencil. Just make it with a pen, old school, and pop it in the copy machine and then you have that template to distribute to your students. Another option, if you prefer working on screen, you can do online, you know, or in a software, little shapes on Google Slides or whatever you wanna use, PowerPoint, and stick some clip art or shapes or graphic organizer pieces and just build the basic background outline 
Um, add some interactive tasks if you can and visual memory triggers if you can. Um, if you can't, you can print it as is and have the students incorporate those as you guide them through it to make sure that it becomes truly the, the brain-based method. Um, but you can do it you know, with clip art or the stencils or what you can do too is take um, sticker templates and just quickly, this is even easier than stencils because they're kind of already shaped out for you and just stick on a page, build your little um, sticker page with the doodle note template stickers there's a free pack of these too so you would just have to buy you know just a couple simple pages of full page sticker paper you wouldn't even need a lot and you can build that just one copy of it as the teacher and then once you have your teacher copy of the sticker layout you want you make your photocopies and distribute the the black line of it to your students and then they can go ahead and fill it out and interact and do the doodling and the, the note taking and the vocabulary words and all that right on there. Um, this is really handy if you need to differentiate because what you can do is put your sticker basic outline, then add a little bit of teacher input, like do a little bit of notes guidance, very minimal, and then photocopy it. And then you can add more guidance for students who might need more and complete a little bit more skeleton of the note sheet for them if they need more guidance and then make more photocopies. So now you have two versions. You copied it before you put a lot of teacher input in there and then you copy it again after you've already provided a lot of teacher input and you can distribute the different ones to the different kids based on how much structure they need already provided to them and how much you're expecting them to put in as their own student input onto the page. So that way, you know, you can kind of choose how much is teacher input, how much is student input, but you can do it in a couple different versions for different groups. Um, and then there's also, you can do kind of like street signs and roads. If, you, if there's any kind of lesson content that needs um, like a flow chart kind of an outline or steps in a process, then you can kind of represent it like roads or pipes that the students go along and complete their steps as they go. So those are kind of easy images to, to either draw yourself or you can use these kits or you can, you know, build it with, with, with different simple clip arts and, and make this yourself on the back end as just a DIY project pretty quickly and easily. Um, I do have, uh, if, if people are really interested in diving deep in the Doodle Note Club, that membership, it's, I mean, it's like, it's packed with value. There's a ton of stuff in there. So there's clip art. You can build it on screen. There's all the little cards. Every, everything's included there. Absolutely everything. So you can have all the DIY stuff and all the pre-made, you know, templates that you can just use, um, use them as they are. Okay, so if you need any help with this, just reach out and let me know, um, you know, where you're stuck and what your questions are. But there's ways to kind of do all these things on your own, and then you can learn more at the Master App blog. I have a whole Doodle Notes tab there. Um, or you can go to doodlenotes.org, which is a great starting place. And there's a quick start page that has just like free stuff to get you just going right away, already like ready to go out the door. So you can just dive in without having to know too much more or do anything. Um, and I hope you enjoy this and I hope your students love it. Let me know what they think. Give me some feedback. I love hearing all the good stories. Have a great day.